Hello guys and welcome to this Volks Wizard video which is the first in a new series of videos celebrating 45 years of the Golf GTI. There are going to be eight videos, each one will feature in great detail an interesting example from each of the eight generations of Golf GTI that we've had so far and we're going to get the ball rolling with a particularly good one, probably the hardest GTI to get your hands on because just 400 were ever made and only 150 came to the UK. It is of course the king of the Nürburgring, the Mark 7. Golf GTI Club Sport S. Now this pristine example is the crown jewels of Volkswagen UK's heritage fleet. It normally spends its time in a dehumidified cocoon, but it's had its slumber disturbed for it to be here today. And that wouldn't have been possible without you guys support for this channel. So big thanks to everybody for that. Now I actually used to own one of these, so I've got a lot to tell you about this car. And to do that, we need to go back in time to 2015 which wasn't a particularly good year for Volkswagen. I'll remember 2015 for two key things. Firstly, it was the launch of the Mark 7 Golf GTI Club Sport, which spawned the Club Sport S. But also we had the Dieselgate scandal, which sent tremors through the whole Volkswagen organization. And it's interesting to think those two events were just a few weeks apart. So in early September, we had Dieselgate causing headlines right across the world. And then a few weeks later in Portugal, we had the launch of the Club Sport. So it was really good to see something positive from Volkswagen. And I can only think we were very lucky to get the Club Sport and the Club Sport S because if Dieselgate had kicked in any sooner, and it could have done because the cars concerned in America were Mark 6s that had been out of production for three years, if the American Environmental Agency had found out about the defeat device earlier, we might have found the whole Club Sport project had been canned. So looking back now, these cars are even more important than they were back then. And you can see from what's come out of Wolfsburg since, I don't think we'll see anything like this ever again. There's no talk of a ring record Mark 8. The Edition 45 is mechanically the same as the Club Sport, which is still good. I mean, they're great cars, but they just don't seem to be as special as the Club Sports. I watched that review of the launch. I think it was the one by Dan Prosser when he worked at Evo, and I was pretty sold on the Club Sport. I swore I'd never buy another Volkswagen again after the trouble I had with my Mark 7 Golf R, but aerodynamically honed body, bucket seats, cup two tyres like a Bugatti Veyron. I had to have that car. While Dan was in Portugal, he interviewed Carsten Stebstadt, who was the chassis engineer on the Club Sport project, and Carsten goes back a long way in the industry. First thing I'd heard he'd done was the Mark 1 Ford Focus chassis, which was an amazing chassis on a very mundane car. It made the Mark 4 Golf drive like a wheelbarrow. And he'd done GT cars for Porsche, but he'd also done the Mark 5 Golf GTI chassis. And that was basically the reason why the GTI had its return to form. Pretty much straight away, I started trying to buy one, but I don't think you could have until early 2016. And I nearly pushed the button but I saw a photo of a car in the old paddock at the Nürburgring that had the extra letter next to the Club Sport. And a bit of research revealed that Volkswagen were going out to claim the front wheel drive lap record at the Nürburgring's Nordschleife. They were doing that with a stripped out version of the Club Sport called the Club Sport S. They were going to build them in very limited numbers and that was it. There wasn't an awful lot going on in the news about it. But there was when they actually got the record, which happened a few weeks later, test driver and racing driver Benny Leuchter uh, did a lap in 7 minutes 49 and 21, taking the lap record away from Honda. So of course there was a big media outpouring of all this. That was it. The car was an instant legend, even before you could buy one. It turned out they were coming to the UK, just 150, although out of the 400 in total, that was quite a big chunk of cars. They were 33,995. There were no options to be had and just three colours, red, white and black. And of course, I really, really wanted one. So with no discount to be had, it was just a question of finding a dealer that would let you have one because with 150 cars, that's probably one per dealer max. I think some dealers didn't even get them. So I gradually got further and further away from the Midlands before I could find a dealer that would let me have one. And I rang up David Lay, who was sales manager then at Murray's Volkswagen in Newton Abbott in Devon and he said yeah we'd be very happy to have you 
as our customer will propose you to Volkswagen. And there's a lot of anxious waiting time then until the 1st of August or 6th of August 2016, when the order books opened and basically Volkswagen allocated cars to people. And I remember seeing the email clearly from a lady called Freddie at Milton Keynes. She said, we've got you a car. This was to the sales manager. It's got to be black. So David said, we've got your car. Like, like Henry Ford, any colour as long as it's black. And of course I said yes. I didn't really want black. I wanted a low maintenance colour, but I wasn't going to say no. So after that, there was a lot and a lot of waiting involved. The waiting was made even more painful when I went to a Pistonhead's um, 40th anniversary of the Golf GTI event at Milton Keynes, where they had a club sport there. It was a white left-hand drive car and it had weirdly parking sensors on it which actually not part of the spec there was a uk launch as well which involved a gray one which wasn't even a color for the car and that was at crick Howe in south wales and that car also went to the nurburgring with rory reed where he drove around chasing supercars with sabine schmidt i forgot to say just after the lap record was announced and they announced you could buy the car there was an international launch at the nurburgring and my good friend, Neil Burkett, who was editor of Volkswagen Drive magazine, went on that. Neil had never been to the ring before, and his first experience of it was driving a club sport SRN in convoy with Benny Leuchter. When he got back, I asked him what he thought of the car, and he just gave me three letters to tell me what he thought of it. W, T and F. Now, if you know Neil, that's not his style at all. So you can tell how blown away he was by the event and the car. He came back with a little souvenir given to all the press, which I acquired off him. It's the wooden circuit map of the Nordschleife signed by the test driver Benny Leuchter. It's got the time on it there and it's got a signature as well of Hans Joachim Stuck who's the famous German racing driver and Volkswagen ambassador. My order went in in August and the piston head event was August as well and then not a lot happened until my car arrived in December. It coincided with two things. Firstly Benny had been around the ring in October and beaten his own time by two seconds so it's 7.47.19, uh, that was embargoed until the December. It was a real nice touch for it to become public just as the cars were being picked up by customers like me. Also, Evo magazine, I think it had the funny grey car for their car of the year test in probably the late summer. And they put it second behind a Porsche 911 R. That was an incredible outcome for Volkswagen. So yeah, I had my car for... Uh, just under two years, did about 5,000 miles in it. I enjoyed it, but I didn't enjoy it as much as I probably should have done. I didn't want to take it on track because I was too precious over it. And I found not having parking sensors because I parked it in my garage a bit annoying and it was pretty impractical. And then sort of cars like the TCR came out and they gave you pretty much all the performance of the Club Sport S, but with none of the downside. So I sold it and I bought an R8. And yeah, I'd love to have it back. I know who owns it but I think that's water under the bridge now and I love my Marquette Golf GTI Club Sport because I get a bit of that Club Sport S thrill every day. Anyway, let's now have a closer look at this beautiful car. Okay, we're gonna break the habit of a lifetime with the Club Sport S and start by looking under the bonnet. Now it's not any different to other Mark 7s with the EA 888 four-cylinder petrol turbo engine. In fact, the only visible difference is that we don't have a soundproofing pad, which shaves off a few grams, and I think it lets a bit more of the engine noise out, giving it a bit more character. This particular EA888 is coded CJX, which is the same as the equivalent Mark 7 Golf R, but due to software changes, it actually produces a bit more power. So it's got 310 metric horsepower versus 300 of the Golf R. To put that into the perspective, the normal Club Sport Edition 40 produced 265 horsepower or 290 with overboost. And I drove one of those recently and that still feels like a really quick car. It does feel like all of it's 290, but because this is lighter, it's got more power, this feels massively quicker at some expense to practicality, as I'll show you shortly. This engine also produces 380 newton meters of torque. So yeah, it's quite a potent engine, particularly in a car weighing just 1,285 kilograms. That's 200 kilograms lighter than my Mark 8. Now, externally, there is not an awful lot of difference between this Club Sport S and the normal Club Sport Edition 40, but that's no bad thing because 
they both have a couple of detail changes over the normal GTI that make a big difference. The most important one is that we have an aerodynamically honed front bumper with very exciting sounding air curtains that let air go into the wheel arch. You can see right through there. And we've also got quite a deep front splitter. The reason for that is that Volkswagen were intent on reducing the lift that hatchbacks suffer at high speed. So along with that bumper, they also stuck on a pretty humongous rear spoiler to push the back end of the car down at speed. Rather interestingly, they kind of left the rear balance alone. There's no sort of diffuser strikes in it at all. It's perfectly smooth. While we're down here, take a look at the exhaust pipes. They're significantly bigger than the normal GTIs, same as the Edition 40, though they make a lot more noise, as I'll show you later. When the 7.5 GTI came out a few months later, actually the exhausts were pretty similar size to these. For the geeks out there, please note this car's got different tail lights to the standard GTI. They're actually tinted and they're the ones from the Golf R and that's a tradition that goes back to the Mark V Edition 30 which had the tail lights of the Mark V R32. Same with the Mark VI. Let's talk about the wheels then. So when you, if you ordered a Club Sport Edition 40 there are a choice of wheels. You got the Corantas which were 18s, a nice forged wheel with Bridgestone tyres. You could have had Brescias which were a 19 inch wheel that came with Pirelli P0s or the hardcore option was Pretorias in black. So this was a Golf R wheel really, in black with Michelin Pilot Sport Cup 2 tyres. I think they were like two and a half thousand pounds extra for those. With the Club Sport S, there was no optional wheel. You only got Pretorias, you only got Michelin Pilot Sport Cup 2 tyres. So this car is kind of wrong in two ways and that's because the wheels shouldn't be black. That was only an Edition 40 Club Sport option, they should be the silver you got on the Golf R, the early Mark 7s. And it's got Pirelli P0s and that's because this car isn't, is very precious and they don't want idiots like me crashing it when it's on Michelin Pilot Sport Cup 2 tyres in the rain. If I ordered this car, booked it to go on track, Volkswagen would fit Cup 2 tyres, but I'm pretty happy it's got the Pirellis going by the weather today because we're going to go and drive it shortly. Another little change that is very hard to notice is that the Club Sport S front axle got more negative camber. That means the wheels, instead of doing that, are like that. And that helps the tyre be in a better position when it's loaded up in corners. I think the reason they don't do that normally on cars is because it probably causes more rolling resistance and it wears tyres out unevenly. So that's a very subtle difference over the Club Sport, but a very important one. And it's important because they had to engineer, re-engineer they call it the knuckles but it's basically the hub and that was specific to this car it's also got an aluminium subframe which they made a big song and dance about but you kind of didn't think it was that great when you realized that every single audi a3 that was um, being made at the same time whatever engine it had had an aluminium subframe but yeah it's cool to have it on this car it's a little bit stiffer it actually made a reappearance on the 2020 model year tcr as well but they are the only golfs to get it. Now let's talk about the brakes then. So I probably in many years ago called these bigger than the normal uh, Edition 40 but they're not. They're actually 340 mil that's the same as the GTI Performance and the Club Sport Edition 40 but importantly they are two-piece brakes which means they're very good at dissipating heat. The calipers are the same as the ones on the GTI Performance and Edition 40 but rather coolly instead of saying GTI which is quite nice they say Club Sport S on them and of course that's reflected in the logo on the side of the car there with that magic S that enticed me all those years ago in the paddock at the Nürburgring. Right let's have a look inside starting with the boot. I don't normally start with the boot but this is why. Take a look at that. That's probably one of the best Club Sport S angles where you just see right through to the back of the front seat with their cutouts. So yeah, we are missing a spare wheel, we are missing toolkit, we are missing boot floor, we are missing parcel shelf, we are missing rear seat belts and of course we are missing rear seats, all to save weight. And yeah, 1285 kilograms. Volkswagen actually went a bit too far when it came to saving weight because they forgot to supply a towing eye which dealers had to pass on to customers 
at a later date. So instead of those normal bits and pieces, we have this scaffold pole and we have this net and where the rear seat should be, there's a felt pad that's Velcroed onto the existing carpet. So yeah, we've seen this before with the TT Quattro Sport, but that wasn't really more for show. This was really to do a job and that's to set the ring record and that's what it, that's what it did. While we're at the back here, please note there are no parking sensors on this car, front or back, which um, yeah, you have to remember because it's quite unusual. It's the only GTI not to have them. The Club Sport only had them on the back. Okay, let's have a look at the cabin then on the Club Sport S. So from here, it's very Edition 40 and that's no bad thing at all because you get this lovely Alcantara, you get leather look, elbow pads, you get the red stitching, you get inlays with honeycomb. That was the GTI trademark since the Mark V. That continues to the dash over there. Standard on the Club Sport S, optional on the Club Sport Edition 40, are these incredible Recaro bucket seats that make the ones you get in the Mark VIII with their fixed headrests and yeah, and make them look pretty rubbish, really. And I love the way you can tilt them forward with that integrated lever. We've got stainless pedals, three of them. Please note there is no DSG option on this car. And we've got GTI floor mats with a thick red stripe and the GTI logo on there, right? Let me get in the car and give you a better look. Okay, the first thing that you notice when you're installed in the hot seat of the Club Sport S is how well the Recaro bucket seats support you, particularly with their lower bolsters, which are pinching my thighs together. I'm not the biggest bloke in the world, but if I was only a little bit bigger, I'd probably feel quite uncomfortable in these seats, but I wouldn't expect the car to give me any sympathy. It would just say, go and lose some weight like it already has. Elsewhere, it's pretty standard late Mark 7 GTI. So we've got Apple CarPlay and Android Auto with App Connect. We've got navigation. We've even got heated seats, which were standard on the GTIs by this point, but they seem a bit incongruous in this stripped out car. You can actually get Club Sport Edition 40s that don't have heated seats. There were no options to upgrade the entertainment to the bigger screen. The only option was to delete the climate. So there are some cars with slightly different knobs that are pretty cool because they don't have any of the AC function, which I think is a very rare thing on a Mark 7. Down here, we have the probably only unique bit, which is the integration of the unique number into the center console on this piece of aluminium. This car's number 175 of 400. We've got a lovely golf ball gear knob and we've got this red stitching on this Alcantara gear gator, which matches the steering wheel. Lovely, this, they're both common to the Club Sport Edition 40. The only difference, have you noticed it yet? We do not have cruise control buttons because we do not have cruise control, even though we have the radar at the front of the car. The story goes that originally these cars weren't going to come with the radar, but somebody at Volkswagen UK realised that the insurance classification for any GTI was based upon it having the emergency braking function. So very late when they ordered the cars for the UK market, they had to include the radar. We're also missing the centre console uh, armrest here. And check out this bit. What's missing from there? Yep, the parking sensor on and off button is missing because there aren't any. We're also missing ambient lighting from the door. So there should be a red light under there. It's not there. And if you look at this sill cover here, where normally there's ambient lighting, it's just solid aluminium. This car's done 4,125 miles during its four and a half years on this planet. And I think now it's time to go and add a few more. So let's go and drive the Mark 7 Golf GTI Club Sport S. Well, unfortunately, we're not in Nürburgring testing in this car. We're not even in South Wales where the original UK launch was. I've only got the car for a weekend and it's raining pretty much right through that weekend. So I've decided to stay locally, but that's not a bad thing because I'm going to test it on roads that I know intimately and on which I've driven many, many performance Volkswagens over the last few months. So let's get the ball rolling then. So it's got a key, a really normal key, and that goes in the ignition there and starts the car. That's novelty. So we'll do that. We have to press the clutch. It's got a clutch as well. It's got three pedals. I think you press this left one to start the car. 
and turn the key. And it starts with a pop or a number of pops, which is so un Volkswagen. And GTIs have been mute up until this point, and this car's got more exhaust flatulence than you probably really want, particularly when you're in race mode. Other little things with the Club Sport S is that we, we've got a start-stop system, but it starts in the off mode, so you have to turn it on if you want it, which I'm sure a lot of people are very envious of, probably more so than the Alcantara uh, steering wheel, but it's a, just a little sign that the engineers have got a sense of humour. The other thing is we have the ring mode, but it's not branded Nürburgring like it is on the Mark 8. It's basically the individual mode. If you reset it, it doesn't put everything into normal. It puts the dampers into comfort and everything else into race. And that's because when Benny Leuchter, the test driver, did the Nürburgring lap record, that's how he ran the car, because he used the curbs a lot. And that's pretty much like driving on a British B road because they're so bad. The other little change with this car is that we don't have sport mode. We have race mode. Normally that's a preserve of the R, but no, on this car it is race, not sport. We don't have electric folding mirrors, which I should have mentioned earlier. Um, they're electric adjust, but they don't fold in, which you might find a bit of a pain when you park it in your garage. Also, we don't have parking sensors, which is a pain for the same reason, but we don't need to worry about that today. We're just gonna have some fun. So. There's nothing up ahead. I'm on a road. I know well. It's late on a Saturday. I'm in a Club Sport S. Could life get any better? My camera's filming, so yeah. Let's go. Jesus, traction troll. so flatulent, it's had a tin of baked beans, it just wants to fart all the time and it's it's a manual, nobody's told it, it's a manual, why is it doing a DSG fart? It's hilarious. Okay, it's a bit quieter in other modes, thankfully. So yeah, the roads are a bit greasy, so I've got to treat this pristine car with respect, but the torque which is all the way up to 5,700 RPM with just 1,285 kilograms to shift makes this car just incredible to drive. Just truly, truly mind-blowing. It's so fast. It makes you want to go on a diet and get more of that. The gearbox, I don't normally like manuals. I've moved on to DSGs, but this car makes me want a manual Again, it's incredibly slick. And the clutch is lovely and light. Just like the car, oh, a bit of dry tarmac there, and it explodes out of the corner. I think I might have said I get similar thrills from a Mark 8. I, I'll take that back now, there's no way. There's no way any other GTI thrills like this. It's just incredible. Incredible. Yeah, the brakes are pretty good too. Although I've heard reports that they're not necessarily going to like track days that are longer than about eight minutes. I'd honestly forgotten how mental this car is. Ah. Okay, you can't put a bike in it, you can't take your mates out in it. You have to be really careful when you park it. You have to be really careful where you park it because these seats are worth about six grand. But... Yeah, it's... Um, it's a very good GTI to start this um, uh, 45 years of GTI series with. And yeah, I'm a bit emotional actually because I had this car, I didn't use it that well properly, I sold it, and now I'm actually quite sad. And they're sort of 40 grand now, they're much more than they were when they were new for a good low miler. So I don't think I'll ever, I'll ever be able to afford one again. So it's big thanks to Volkswagen UK 
for trusting me with this utterly, utterly beautiful, pristine example, which I, would have only, I wouldn't have got without you guys' support. So again, thanks to you guys for all your help. And I hope you've enjoyed this video. If you have, give it a thumbs up, please comment, please share, please subscribe, and I'll see you for the next one. If I ever stop driving this amazing car,